So Professor Thompson is one of the intensivists at the Royal, for those of you that don't know him. He's um, going to talk about the ethics of ICU admission. Very good, thanks, Zoe. Um, so as we said, the, the, the uh, part of this afternoon's sort of session is about ethical decision making. So what we all consider now the, the four principles of, of medical ethics, I'm sure you all know these and you, I'm sure you all know the um, definition. So autonomy essentially is respect to the patient's right to self-determination, in other words, patients make their own decisions um, and uh, we should treat them essentially with humanity. Um, beneficence, of course, the duty to do good. Non-maleficence, um, first do no harm or uh, duty not to to do not to do bad, uh, and justice, or rather distributive justice, is probably a better definition. Um, is that we treat all people uh, equitably and equally. In other words, we treat people fair, fairly. Uh, but that doesn't just apply to the um, patient. It, it, um, we have an obligation to uh, distribute resources and use treatments. Um, equally as well. And so just, and that includes the staff and to society. Okay. I'm really sorry, there's a problem here. <clears throat> okay, what is intense care and what we do? Now, again, some of you, um, well, of course you all know this, uh, but the, the history is kind of quite interesting. And intense care came out of the polio epidemic uh, in 1952. And it was this an anaesthetist called Bjorn Ibsen who was asked to help um, by a physician um, to treat initially somebody with congenital tetanus. Uh, and he, he sort of, because he did curare in his anaesthetic practice, he had the idea of performing, uh, getting a surgeon to perform a tracheostomy. Um, and he used curare to, to paralyse the patient and then uh, treatment and the, the outcome was pretty good. And then a few months later, he was again called um, to the to the children's ward, um, and there was a 12-year-old girl who was an extremist who was septic with uh, polio meningitis and having a severe respiratory difficulty. Um, and what he did, he again got a surgeon to come along and perform a tracheostomy. And apparently, the story goes that when uh, the trachea went in, uh, the child was unventilatable. And so everybody else left the room and thought it was all hopeless. But he uh, realised that um, the, the, the child had severe bronchospasm and he gave, gave some thiopentone and it sort of uh, it fixed. And if, I don't know if you notice on the, the picture on the bottom there, that now this is a real example of 1950s holistic care uh, where the patient is in a ventilator and is, is being assisted to have a fag by the nurse. And of course, if the ventilator is set hard, it will make you inhale better. So that's, 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 that's very kind, I think. OK, and out of that really came uh, came intensive care. Oh, sorry. And then what happens that with with his successful treatment of this girl with polio, he, he spread it out and very, very quickly the practice changed so that all patients then uh, underwent um, trachism and manual uh, post ventilation by a team of about 1500 uh, nurses, medical students, volunteers. Uh, so, so that he said he need, and they worked, worked around the clock in, in a sort of 100 bed unit, and the mortality decreased um, spectacularly. Uh, and intensive care was born as a specialty. So, what is intensive care and what do we do? Well, you know, this we provide all the support, we provide trials of therapy. Uh, very importantly, we provide palliative care, including to the family, and linked to that sometimes is organ donation. Um, but I think crucially, we also manage expectations and we manage expectations for the patient, for their family, uh, and for um, other staff and colleagues around the hospital as well. And the bottom is a quote from Dan Harvey, actually, and I think it, quite ring, it rings quite true. The intensive care is about two thirds acute physiology, pathophysiology and pharmacology and one third ethics. Um, and certainly I think as consultants and as, as you progress through training, um, you'll find that we, you spend more of your time thinking about what the right course of uh, 
action is for a particular patient as much as thinking is the best way to treat them. And in terms of what the Department of Health thinks we are, um, the purpose of intensive care is quite clear. Um, um, it's to avoid unnecessary suffering and premature death uh, by treating reversible illnesses for an appropriate period of time. So the key phrases in there are reversible and appropriate period of time. Uh, and if we do that, we should be able to improve clinical outcomes, but again, for suitably selected patient uh, groups of patients. And very clearly in the Department of Health's definition of uh, provision of intensive care um, is the concept of the capacity to benefit and you'll have heard, heard that quite a lot probably in uh, handovers and coffee room um, uh, conversations. Now what don't we do, and this is really for the medics in the hospital, we don't admit all the sickest patients and that's certainly true. Uh, we can't reverse terminal decline, we can't prolong life when there's no hope of recovery uh, and I think probably one of our strengths as a specialty um, is that we we do, I think, try and take all the important decisions. We don't um, either delegate those or sort of pass, pass the book. We try, we certainly try to do that. Another uh, person to remember is Peter Sapphire, and he was um, the professor of resource medicine in um, the States in the 50s, and he opened their first intensive care. Um, and he's known as the father of CPR, but crucially, he did recognise the limitations of, of um, life support and uh, CPR. And he said it was for the person with a heart and a brain too good to die. So in other words, he recognised that it was something that should be uh, applied selectively. Now, how do you decide an ICU admission? Well, the problems that we face is that we've got an increasing elderly population. We've got more expectations from patients, families, colleagues. We've got more brighter and shinier things that we can do. However, we're expensive and our resources are limited. And what sort of frameworks and guidance is, is there to guide us, particularly in terms, not in terms of sort of therapies, but in terms of ethics? And the crucial thing here, and I think everybody should be aware of, because we all have to do mandatory training on uh, mental capacity training, is the Mental Capacity Act 2005. And that introduced a number of key concepts out sort of five domains. And the first of these was, was that we must presume capacity unless uh, otherwise stated. In other words, we must assume that patients have um, the right uh, to be um, uh, intimately involved in any decisions that we make. Uh, we must support individuals to make their own decisions, even if these are unwise or we consider them unwise. And of course, the, uh, some of that is in the, in the perception. So, in a, you know, an example might be a Jehovah's Witness uh, who refuses a blood transfusion. We have, we're obliged to support that. But what we also have to do, and again, it's in the, the act, is that we have to act in the best interests of the patients by considering all the uh, variables. So I'm going to come on to those a bit later. And we also um, have to consider options which are less restrictive of an individual's rights. And so an example of that might be somebody who is um, uh, incapacitated at the moment, but might need uh, an elective operation, in which case, an elective or maybe an urgent operation, but one that can wait a little bit, that we should um, uh, actually consider an option other than uh, acting on their behalf. In other words, allow them to regain capacity and let them consider the decision. Uh, crucially, the Medical Capacity Act also introduced something called the Court of Protection and uh, the uh, independent mental capacity advocates and the idea of the lasting power, powers of the attorney. So it put everything on much more of a, a sort of established and, and legal footing. Now these were sort of based on a couple of famous cases. The first one is the Tony Bland case. And I don't know if you remember, Tony Bland was a Liverpool football supporter who was caught up in the Hillsborough disaster. Um, which was the FA Cup semi-final played at Hillsborough in April 1989 uh, and unfortunately he um, 
sustained severe crush injuries, severe chest injuries, and suffered a cardiac arrest. And subsequent to that, um, was resuscitated, but had severe anoxic brain damage. Uh, and um, three to four months later, he was still in a persistent vegetative state. So he was um, he was able to breathe spontaneously for himself. Cardiovascular uh, function was fine, but he was in a vegetative state, unable to interact or do anything. Um, and it was uh, one of the doctors in Airedale Hospital, uh, a physician, I believe, who um, applied to withdraw his artificial feeding tube and fluids with the support of his parents. Uh, but when he spoke to the coroner and subsequently the police, they advised him that that would be uh, unlawful. And if he did that, he would be convicted of murder. So he decided not to do that and then applied to the courts. Now, the courts initially um, supported his and the parents' decision. Uh, but that was when then refer, referred to the, uh, I think it was the Solicitor General who uh, wants to overturn that. Um, that was um, uh, that was declined, but again a further appeal, the Court of Appeal took the case and eventually it went to the House of Lords who eventually decided in, in, in favour of the family and, and the doctors that feeding could be withdrawn. Um, but that took until 1993, um, so it took about four years and he was in the vegetative state all, all this time. But it was an important, um, um, it, it was an important judgment because, um, well, A, the doctor at the time was, was going to be threatened with, with murder if he if he'd pursued the course of action that he thought was best. And the second sort of important legal case was one, uh, a chap called Leslie Burke, who had challenged the GMC's guidance similarly about um, withdrawal of, withdrawal of uh, artificial nutrition and hydration. Now, Leslie Burke was a 45 year old guy who had uh, spinocerebral ataxia, so a, a degenerative and un incurable uh, neurological disorder. Uh, at the time he brought the case, he um, uh, he was in a wheelchair, but um, had um, uh, is in full capacity, full mental capacity, and wasn't expected to lose his uh, mental capacity until the very late stages of his illness, when he thought that he might become um, obtunded. And his uh, he wanted to challenge the GMC guidance at the time, which was that nutrition and hydration could lawfully be withdrawn and he challenged that and again it went through a protected uh, legal case eventually um, up to the European Court of Human Rights um, um, who all upheld um, the GMC's um, uh, position uh, which was adopted under no legal or ethical obligation to agree to a treatment if they consider the treatments not in the best interests. Um, it reaffirmed the situation regarding um, mental capacity. In other words, that um, uh, patients should be should have the right to make their own decisions, but that doctors don't have to provide something that's considered not in their best interest. And that was important in a landmark case. So back to the first of the pillars of. Um, medical ethics. So this is the uh, autonomy is defined again, it's in the NHS litigation authority, which is now called NHS resolution. If anybody's interested in look on their website, uh, UHL becomes quite prominently as one of the landmark cases uh, that was uh, for which the NHS was sued. But I'll leave you to look at that or, or we can discuss it later. Um, but they've just uh, affirm that patients have a fundamental legal ethical right to determine what happens to their own bodies. Uh, we can't force them to follow our advice, but again affirm that we can refuse treatment if we think it's not in the patient's best interest. So what do we mean by uh, benefits or, or maleficence? And so in a little bit more detail, you know, this is uh, first do no harm and, and we have to do everything um, uh, in the best interest of the patient. Uh, 
uh, it means a little bit more than that. So it means that we're um, obliged to assess both the potential benefits of any proposed treatment and the risks of harm. Um, and I think for intensive care, we would probably extend that to the consequences of critical illness um, in the broader sense and also to, to the patient, the individual patient. Um, we also have to discuss with and communicate the decisions that we make to the patient, the relatives and their other care professionals. So what do we mean by capacity to benefit? Now, when I was a young doctor, I thought intense care was like the chap on the right, really, because my, in my experience, when you had acutely ill patients on medical wards, um, the intensive care doctors would uh, ride down on a white horse, usually dressed in white as well, and kind of rescue the patient from, um, from you, um, and then deliver them back uh, frail and, uh, what's the word? hale and hearty about a week later. And so I thought this was a magical thing to do and, and, one, and thought it would be um, uh, interesting to learn about what they did, um, which as you can see from the picture right on the right is really lots about complicated things in machines, but of course it's a lot more than that. What we also have to think about is the consequences of both critical illness and admission to uh, intensive care. Now, um, the consequences of critical illness are profound and they relate to the, both the disease process uh, in terms of the stress response, its effects on the heart, on the breathing, respiratory system, endocrine system, hematology, liver, immune function, gut, sleep, you name it. So it's an incredibly stressful thing uh, just per se, but then on top of it, we do all sorts of things to uh, patients in intensive care and all of these have consequences which sometimes we don't think about so but you know putting somebody on, on a ventilator has a number of cardiovascular cardiovascular uh, effects effects on the kidneys effects on uh, the endocrine and metabolic function uh, we do things to people in terms of drugs sedatives analgesic fluids renal replacement therapy, etc., which all potentially have uh, adverse effects, including the effects of monitoring, uh, monitoring lines, vascular access, and in particular other procedures that we perform, uh, which can all have uh, uh, adverse effects. And then on top of that, we place uh, people in a sort of torturous uh, environment, which affects both the sleep um, their cognitive dysfunction and that can produce um, psychological security which we uh, appreciate more perhaps now than we did 20 years ago um, but also cross infection of course so coming to intensive care is not a walk in the park now what factors determine outcome and these are things that we kind of know about so the physical physiological function um, especially cardiopulmonary reserve Functional status is important, and in, into that um, uh, category we put frailty. Um, but also the reversibility of the disease in the current context, and there below is a list of a number of things which which do influence uh, the outcome. So, in in general terms, surgical um, uh, outcomes after surgical procedures are better than sort of unfiltered medical diseases. Elect is better than emergency surgery. Uh, multiple organ failure, ARDS, acute lung injury generally have a worse outcome than, than average intensive care. Uh, some malignancies are worse than others, uh, patients who are Im immunocompromised, immobile, etc. So there are a number of specific processes uh, which do affect uh, reversibility. Um, the important thing there is, is in the current context and so um, we, we've all heard the uh, registrars in maybe oncology or haematology telling is a predicted average um, one year, five year survival for patients with a particular condition, but they rarely uh, interpret that in the in the context of the other problems that the patient has at presentation. But in addition, the things that we know affect the outcome are so things like comorbidities um, that sort of is interlinked with um, functional status. Uh, the severity of the illness, so septic shock, for example, cardiogenic shock, have a worse outcome. Um, the timing of admission, lots of papers suggesting that um, 
patient to uh, admit it in a timely fashion and what we do to them quickly uh, does have some sort of effect or that the journal club are going to suggest <laughs> opposite to that. But crucially, people's response to therapy within the first 24 to 48 hours is quite often a good uh, indicator of how they would do. Um, treatment limitations, that's a kind of self-serving thing, but also age. So age does have a uh, an effect on that. Okay, I'm going to show you a few of the data slides uh, on the studies that have been performed on the effect of age uh, in patients in ICU. Now, we've all seen this, the clinical frailty score, um, um, and you'll all be aware of a few problems with it, um, which are firstly that it's only been validated in people uh, aged over 65. It's not validated in younger patients or patients with single uh, dysfunctions. There's a certain amount of inter-observer variability and it depends who's asking the questions and what questions are asked. Uh, and crucially we probably ought to get some sort of um, a corroborative history from uh, relatives and, uh, and, and other people um, uh, in order to, to, make it, to make it accurate. What about the being old. Well, being old is not really very good. Um, <laughs> there's the effect of the aging process itself, you know, so there's some sort of inexorable uh, things that decline over age, and these are just physiological, you know, be it uh, cardiovascular, respiratory, more or less every, every, um, every, every organ system declines in function, and the rule of thumb is by about 1% per year after the age of 30, which is, which is a bit sad. Always makes me wonder why we still have people in the House of Lords uh, at the age of 80 or so when the brain function is 50% of what it should be. Um, but on top of that, um, we've got the problem of disease processes which happen just over time to people. The, the older you get, the more chance you, you would have had of having a, a sort of chronic and maybe significant disease. and um, they can be multiple and people get on uh, multiple drugs and have drunk interactions. And then some sort of diseases in addition produce deconditioning, immobility and frailty. So what are the physiological changes with age? You know, apart from, um, you know, sarcomere function, telomere, uh, shortening, etc. Well, in order to illustrate that, um, I'm just going to show a few graphs. Uh, about the, the world record, the world athletic records for anybody who's interested in, in athletics. And the, the following graphs are all the same sort of format. So they will show the world record um, at a, and against the world's fastest time uh, uh, for in age groups. So here we've got the 100 metres world record. So of course that's Usain Bolt's record of 9.58 seconds. And he set that at the age of, of I think about 23. So the sprinters sort of peak peak early uh, and you can see just by following the graph along the x-axis that um, there's, a, there's not much difference up to the age of about 50 but by but above that um, the world record for a 60 year old is something like 14 seconds so it's about 50 percent uh, slower than um, than the world record at whatever the world the uncorrected uh, age world record and once you get about above 90, then um, it goes up incredibly quickly. And um, uh, of course, there, are, there, pro there aren't that many. There isn't a 105 year old world record for men because I don't think um, I don't think anybody could, could do it. Um, but there is a 105 year old record for women, um, which is remarkably quick. Actually, it's about 35 seconds. And the mile, so the mile um that's Hisham al Guruj, isn't it? So he's his time is just under four minutes, about three forty eight, I think. Uh he said that so the middle distance ones they seem to peak in the mid twenties. And again the graph goes up to the right, so it's up by about fifty percent by the age of sixty, and then a decline a, a much sharper decline after the age of sixty. Um, if you look at the pole vault, um, so the pole vaults, the chap, the world record's got that. He's about, he 
He it was about 20 when he set that one, but um, Ser Sergei Bobka was the previous record holder for about 25 years. And he held the record, uh, he set the, his record at 31. So pole vaulting is a sort of slightly different skill, of course it involves strength as well as speed and flexibility. But there's a bit more of a, an inexorable decline in that. And if you look at the javelin, uh, that also declines in a similar sort of fashion. The asterisks there are the, the world record held, the absolute world record I think is still Jan Zelezny and he set that at the age of about 30. Uh, but he was still the age with a record holder at 35 and 40. So you can show, show that for an individual, his best personal best at, at different ages decreased. So even for the top athletes, there's nothing you can do to stop uh, the effects of age. And similarly for the marathon, again, it's the same. The asterisk showed that the, uh, it's the same chap, a uh, chap called Ed Whitlock, I believe, um, who has the same um, he holds the age um, uh, stratified world record from the age of 70 to 85, but he got an awful lot slower during that time. So we can think of that in terms of the consequences of illness and age. And of course, this is just a sort of um, an artificial construct here we, where we've got on the y axis health measured from zero to 100, whatever that particular means. Um, but in terms of somebody's physiological capacity, there will be an, an inevitable decline in their um, uh, functional capacity or their health uh, with time. And if somebody has a relatively minor illness in a, at a young age, they will make a, hopefully make a full recovery, but still uh, get uh, sicker over time. If they have a more moderately severe illness, it will take longer than to recover, but they should still should be able to recover. But somebody who's had a critical life threatening illness, which will last longer, it takes them longer to recover, and they then may may be permanently uh, less able than they would be had they not had that particular illness. And if you look, if somebody who's a bit older and they have the same critical illness, then they will also uh, decline and are likely to have. Uh, a less functional capability than they've not had the illness and to a greater extent as if they had had the same thing earlier and if they then get complications that can lead to a further functional decline and if you're elderly uh, have a moderate severe illness in old age then it's unlikely that you will uh, make a significant recovery okay so that's just a sort of con construct to, do, to illustrate the, um, uh, the the concept now here's some data from the lri which between 2013 and 15 and on the top line you can see the total admissions here so our admissions in 2003 were 940 admissions in 2015 we'd increased by about 50 percent to 1440 admissions uh, and then looking at different age groups we've got the aged under 65 went uh, up to um, by a similar sort of a slightly lower proportion but a similar sort of proportion and a similar proportion in the 60s to 75 75 to 85. In fact the proportion of patients aged 85 or over increased from well fourfold from 11 to uh, to 40. But interestingly, if you look at the mortality of those those patients, the mortality, and again the graphs um, uh, slightly transposed here, so that the on the x axis we've got it stratified by age. Um, but in 2003, and in all age groups, there's a, re a relationship between increased age and increased mortality. But in 2003. Uh, okay, there were only 11 patients, but the mortality was uh, a third uh, in the over 85. But more latterly, in 2015-2012, uh, the mortality is, is actually got a little bit lower for the very elderly group. So I thought that was quite an interesting observation. So maybe we are doing better uh, as time has gone on. And similar sort of patterns for um, hospital um, mortality is the same data um, but what you can see is that the, the hospital mortality even though uh, uh, it's slightly lower for the for the elderly than it had been.
I'm just going to run through a few papers looking at uh, mortality in a, in the elderly. So here's um, a, it was a this was a registry from um, uh, um, I think it was 15 uh, intensive care units in France looking at 23,000 uh, patients, including 3,000 over 80. And the groups 0, 1, 2 and 3 were sort of stratified by um, amount of organ support. So it's more or less equivalent to a sort of level 1, uh, level 2, level 3, uh, uh, level 0 organ support. And what you can see is that again, if you look at the effective age, then uh, the mortality was increased in all of those groups uh, with increased age. Um, but it was also obviously related to the amount of organ support needed. Um, this is another uh, uh, European study um, looking at uh, benefit again in the elderly. Uh, and in, here's this is the total um, number of patients uh, admitted according to age. So fewer patients aged uh, 84 uh, and over were admitted. But in terms of whether they were accepted or refused admission, there's a bigger difference be between these two in terms of um, the the overall mortality, and that was uh, taken to, to suggest that there was a, in in those patients who had declined admission, um, they the 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 elderly did much worse, and therefore they had greater capacity to benefit if they had been admitted. And overall, this review article looks at um, the, uh, the the various literature up to what was it, 2007. Um, looking at the elderly patients admitted to intensive care. Um, and of those that, that were admitted, most were female, most had no or few um, uh, com comorbidities. Um, so we were admitting fitter, I suppose, relatively fitter patients to intensive care, um, but um, there was no difference in length of stay between them and younger patients. And what they concluded was that um, although uh, mortality was higher, other factors such as functional status were important. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip the next couple, I think, on, on purpose. Um, so this is, um, yeah, so this is another study of 80 year olds and the, um, again, it, it, it looked at uh, mortality in 600, 600 patients. Um, and mortality was relatively low in uh, ICU and 26% uh, in hospital and 44% at one year, but only 33% returned home and only a quarter made a physical recovery, um, complete physical recovery at one year. And the people that better were the younger ones, those who were less ill, uh, less frail, less co fewer comorbidities and so certain diagnoses, so surgical uh, conditions, surgical elective conditions, cabbage and stroke, generally uh, did, did better. And again, they concluded that frailty was more predictive than age, uh, illness, severity or comorbidity. And this is an interesting sort of uh, qualitative study looking at patients with um, elderly patients with advanced cancer or medical disease and um, discussing things with their family and what th these elderly patients who uh, were towards the end of their life considered important in terms of end of life care was trust and confidence in doctors. They wanted to be involved in decisions. They didn't want to be kept alive, alive with hope for, of meaning, no hope of meaningful recovery. Didn't want to be a burden. Um, they wanted their dignity preserved and also wanted to be able to prepare for life and and say good night, uh, goodbye in a uh, timely and dignified manner. However, um, this is an, another paper from the Canadian group and they looked at uh, patients who were, um, uh, these were hospitalised and again considered at high lift, a risk of uh, death within six months. Elderly, aged 80, and most of them are considered end of life care, and quite a few had an advanced directive or a named surrogate. However, however and only 11% actually preferred life prolonging care, 
at the end at the expense of end of life care. However, the most majority, 70%, have not discussed any of this with the healthcare providers. I'm going to return to that theme in a little while. And this is another study. This is an interview study in uh, in in Paris. So these were patients who had been in hospital, so they'd had significant uh, experience re relatively recently of hospital treatment. Who were now either at home or when assisting uh, assisted living or nursing home. And they presented with films or scenarios telling them exactly what different ICU treatments would involve. So non-invasive ventilation, invasive ventilation. Um, and renal support after invasive ventilation. Uh, and when shown, um, about a quarter refused NIV, almost 40% uh, refused uh, positive pressure ventilation, and uh, the majority refused renal replacement therapy. And the similar sort of concerns that they had about losing uh, the independence about being too old for ITU and didn't want to live longer. And it, again, it was all about quality of life for the for these elderly. And another study from France. So this looked at uh, uh, patients triaged uh, in the ED according to pre-specified uh, referral criteria, which were agreed with the intensive care uh, that uh, these these refer diseases, disease states would be um, eligible for intensive care. Um, and they looked at, these were patients who are over 80, the majority of whom were uh, independent with the ADLs, although most have had some co comorbidity. And there is a big difference, as I'm sure it doesn't surprise you, between the uh, patients that were referred according to, and were eligible according to ICU, um, sorry, accord, eligible for ICU uh, admission according to the ED physician, so they um, were thought that 25% of these patients um, would be eligible, uh, but the intensive care um, uh, physician uh, basically half that accepted that referral in about 50% of cases. So overall, only one in eight patients was deemed um, uh, suitable for admission. But the interesting thing with this is that is the range. So there was a big range between hospitals, um, between one in 20 and one in three almost. And from the same study, um, they also found um, no real relationship between ICU ability and outcomes, except there was an inverse relationship between uh, capacity and um, um, mortality rate. In other words, the patients who had uh, the, the units where more elderly patients were admitted tend to have better outcomes for those patients. So, should age affect our decision making? Well, uh, elderly patients tend to receive fewer interventions and more is withheld. Uh, in terms of the crude mortality uh, data, then Mortality is higher, but in selected patients characterised by a low burden of disease and functional independence, short term outcomes are generally good. So in short, age per se should not necessarily be a, a barrier to being admitted to intensive care. Uh, and crucially, there is also significant variability in decision making. And this is a sort of interesting study which we were involved with. It's just been published in Anesthesia last month or the month before. Uh, this was a sort of ethnographic study, um, which is, I think, worth worth a look. It was um, conducted by a chap called Chris Bassford, who's a consultant in Coventry, and we were involved. And what they got was a team of, as um, they got some psychologists to come and um, observe the interaction at referrals between the referring doctor and uh, the intensivist and then um, and then people were interviewed um, after that to, to discuss uh, uh, their their decision making um, and if you can get past the fact that it uses um, a complicated psychological word like gestalt, gestalt and heuristic then there's some sort of interesting messages and what they observed that the, the decisions what we know, I guess, are often complex, uncertain, and based on incomplete um, information. But as intensive care doctors, 
we actually use sort of heuristic approaches. In other words, we do, we sort of simplify um, decisions to for our own uh, purpose purpose based on our uh, clinical experience. But what we don't do is um, explicitly obtain the family or the patient's wishes, despite intending to do that. And we uh, we're rarely explicit in both our decision making and our explanations um, about balancing the risks. So, what are the psychological the consequences of um, um, ICO mission? Well, in the basis of non maleficence, then. Uh, there's some things that we can do and some things that we can't. Inevitably, uh, there are some long term consequences, including prolonged recovery, uh, which includes um, things that are quite severe and long lasting, be it physical, um, psychological, neurocognitive. Um, However, conversely, one of the consequences of admission to intense care that I didn't mention before is that uh, we do sometimes admit patients for the purposes of prognostication uh, and pro pro providing some certainty um, of, of, of prognosis. And an example of that would be somebody with, for example, a, a potentially devastating brain injury. So have, what are best interests? Well, to, to, to consider this, we must consider both the benefits and burdens of treatment, but also who the relevant parties are. And that means not just the patient, it means not just their family, but it also means um, the staff and to a certain degree um, wider society as well. Uh, what we also have to do is try and concentrate and um, uh, focus on the important outcomes. Um, most ICU research uh, focuses on mortality. Simple reason it's it's easy to measure, um, but in fact the important outcomes to many patients, particularly from those um, studies in the elderly, are not necessarily death. They're, they're much more nuanced than that. In terms of distributive justice, that's about allocating resources appropriately, and sometimes there's a sort of potential conflict between the benefits for society against the benefits uh, of an individual. And what we also have to consider, and it's come up again, uh, particularly in the pandemic, is the concept of moral injury. So that's the injury or the consequences uh, of doing things or not doing things or not being able to do things um, to the staff uh, involved. So, so the four principles, um, and just to finally, uh, to, to, to finally uh, wrap up, there's quite a nice paper in BJ Education, which we published uh, in March last year, and it talks about applying the um, the principles sort of in practice. Um, I'm not quite sure myself about the, the 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 where it ends up in terms of a moral balance tool that they uh, propose. It seems a bit contrived to me, um, but I think it's worth people having a look um, just. Um, as a way of, of framing your decision making and what we ought to do is look at the facts, think what's in scope and out of scope. In other words, what are the salient and important considerations for uh, the patient, the family and um, the team? Um, what are the four outcomes within the four um, principles and then discuss that to inform your decision? Um, and if I guess if I had to summarise the what I think is the principles of uh, medical ethics in one frame, phrase is really treat others as you would wish to be treated. Um, I think certainly in intensive care from my experience and observations, but probably more so in the COVID era because we seem to be having more discussions between consultants. I think uh, I think we, we do that pretty well. Um, maybe our conversations with the family are not as explicit as they could be sometimes, but um, at the time of admission, but they probably are um, afterwards. Um, however, I'm sure we're not perfect and would welcome any observations or comments. And I'll Thank stop. you. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments or input into that?
with a consultant or trainee. Do you want to stop sharing your screen, Jating? I'm looking at. Oh, stop looking at you. Um, <laughs> you mean you mean stop looking at yeah? Uh, um, yeah, cross. That one here. Yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> Ah uh, yes, full text, more of those paper. Thank you, Pip. I think we spent a lot of time talking about admissions and non-admissions and um, during COVID, I think you're right. There's been a lot more um, multi-consultant decisions than there were before, I think, about whether to admit people or not. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we've always done it. Um, We've always considered these things, but we've sort of aired, aired discuss, discussion between ourselves more and probably done a little bit more in the, to the wider group, to the MDT. I don't know if people think that. Or do you think we all keep it secret and make it up? I'm definitely making it up. <laughs> well. So Dr. Smith appears in mobile in the background. Is that similar with green shoes on? Yeah, he's uh, <laughs> right. I think it's really important that you, um, I, ITU admission is not all or, or nothing. Hmm. And you can limit, you can admit to ITU, but do limits of other care. So maybe just admit them for vasopressors or just admit them for NIB. Hmm. How do you how do you prevent the inevitable? Because once they're here, quite often people are admitted, and there's a there's a decision to put a ceiling a ceiling of care, and then that night they deteriorate, and then they end up in hospital support. Um, I guess my question is, I don't know. My question is. <laughs> how, you, how you stop that mission creep? Yes, yeah. Somebody's for whatever, and then you come in the morning and somebody else has gone, actually, yeah, you can be intubated and you've got a person, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. It's a question, how do you stop it? Well, you see, I, I don't think that three o'clock in the morning um, is the right thing to, um, to be sort of changing course necessarily or making treatment limitation decisions. Um, those are best done in the light of day, you know, unless something's spiraling in, in actually down, downwards. Um, they're best made when you can, I've got time to think about them, sometimes step away from the bed. Um, Talk to someone I, else. Yes, speak to someone else, so, so, which is why I always say to you on uh, evening handover is just keep them alive and then we'll sort it out in the morning. Um, with some seriousness behind that, really. It would, um, and I think that the the things that we need to keep um, aware of is, you know, there's a. I think we defend ourselves psychologically by applying certainty to decisions when, in fact, there is none, or, or there's less certainty than we like to believe and less certainty than we convey. Um, you know, certainly if you go outside the unit and, and use, you know, things like phrases like this person's not a candidate for ICU, end it there. That, that you know, that that's, I don't know, it's, it's self-fulfilling for one, one thing, but it's often based on a lot, a, a lot weaker evidence than we would, um, we would like to believe. And there's, there's particular uh, potential for variability within that. So some people are much more didactic or certain in their decisions than, than others. Um, and I think that protects us sometimes for from making mistakes. So, I don't know, the more, the more I learn, the less I know. That's because you see the exceptions to the rule. And, you know, given a couple of examples there where patients did a lot better than we've expected, certainly the 90 year old um, yeah. with a, an acute abdomen is, you know, living happily at home still. Um, so that, that's, that's the idea. This yeah. support consultant, isn't it, to try and get um, during the day that Dr. Smith's been doing this week to try and 
pick up those sick ones during the day and have decisions made before three o'clock in the morning. Um, it is, but I guess what I'm saying is that we to the factual basis for our decision making is a lot less than we would like to think yeah. sometimes. We, and I think we just you, you've always got to kind of remember, remember that. Um, um, you don't need to tell other people. You can keep it a secret and, and keep the mystery of intensive care alive. <laughs> Um, but yeah, well, that's really happy if it creep, <laughs> you keep it a secret. Sorry? That's not going to help the emission creep if you keep it a secret. Um, well, it will, it will if they know that we're not quite sure of what we're saying to them. That, they don't <laughs> need to know that. Do they? I think to ha try and answer your question, Grace, um, try and um, try and have stuff planned beforehand as as JT said, if you don't have a plan, then do what you need to. But in general, but phone is up if you're not sure. That's what we're there for. <laughs> Any other comments? I will, I will throw something onto the table. Actually, you, you mentioned palliative care at the start of your talk. It jogs my memory about a, a mission I I was sort of part of in another trust. It was a, a moribund Burns patient who was transferred from A and E who the certain burns team didn't want to operate on or anything. And this patient ended up getting essentially palliated in quite a bit of our intensive care unit, which raised the eyebrows of a few of the consultant staff in the morning after handover, so to speak. I was wondering what your thoughts would be on patients or situations like that where A&E, for example, are reluctant to palliate a patient and we essentially bring a patient over for a more dignified and sort of comfortable uh, death basically that an A and E side room might not be able to provide. It's, it's just an interesting dilemma that could have been one of your patients at the start. Uh, yeah, I mean, in my, I'd sum it up by the last sentence, which was, you know, treat treat them as you would want to be treated or you'd, you'd want your parents or kids to be treated, really. So that, that's what we're supposed to be about. Um, it becomes more complicated and difficult if when we're strapped for beds. So if that is into your last bed, then that inevitably um, that will influence your decision making. Um, I mean, uh, you know, along with that is if you do need to transfer patients out, should we transfer the fittest patients or the last patients? Um, you know, and that's about again so ethics comes into that it's about doing the less the least harm so our philosophy at this unit has been to transfer if we do need an external non-clinical transfer is to transfer the fittest patients because they've got the uh, the least chance of being harmed by the transfer uh, but i know other units don't adopt that they have a sort of last in first out sort of uh, policy uh, but yeah personally i, I would like I would like to think that I would have admit that that patient um, and do the kindest thing. Um, and it, you know, it's situation dependent depends on your maybe your ED. You know what facilities they have. have. Um, they have and should be able to provide end of life care. And similarly, should there should be side rooms on the ward to provide uh, end of life care. But that isn't always the case, really. Um, you know, we, we're we quite good at providing palliative care, I think, uh, in those sort of circumstances. Basically, we, we can put somebody on a morphine infusion and we don't worry too much about, um, about the consequences in a way that they might on a medical ward, I think. I don't know what other people think. I suspect like any ethical thing, you'll get different answers depending on who you ask. Yeah. Right, what do you think? I agree with you. If I had space I'd, and they couldn't do it downstairs, I'd put them in a side in side room 18. Yeah, I agree. I would just do the most humane thing. Mm. But I suspect that that's that not everyone among the 15 of us would say the same. But No, no, 
So hello everyone, my name is Grace Hoey, I'm uh, an ICU fellow at Bursa Royal Infirmary and the paper that I'm presenting is Early Goal Directed Therapy for Septic Analysis, for Septic Shock, uh, a, a Patient Level Meta Analysis done by PRISM. Um, it was published in 2017 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's riveting, has everyone read it? <laughs> No one's read it. Okay. I read it. Great. So it's a meta-analysis and the question that the, this paper asks is um, they, they wanted to compare the effect of early goal directed therapy versus usual care on 90 day mortality and then they also had some secondary um, targets so that analyzed, analyze and they also did some subgroup analysis of this large group of patients. So it's a multi-center prospective study, um, which was these three groups. So there's a US-based group called Process, an Australasia group called The Rise, and the UK called Promise, which led to PRISM, which is this, uh, this paper. And this is, the, this is what they were trying to do. Um, the reason they wanted to ask this question is there's a paper that was published in 2002 by Rivers et al that found that early goal directed therapy improved mortality and they wanted to see if they could get a higher power study to prove the same. Um, so early goal directed therapy is a sort of resuscitation protocol that has a, a protocolized care for maintaining blood pressure above a certain level of MAP for a fluid, a rapid fluid therapy um, and other targets like maintenance of stats above a certain level and um, also uh, blood products if required in the context of sepsis. Um, I'm just, I've just made that wording bigger in case anyone's struggling to read it. What they've done is um, recruited their patients. So it's a prospective study. So they set their criteria before actually looking for the data rather than a retrospective study. Um, and the early goal directed therapy group uh, was as described in this Rivers, and, um, Rivers paper that I've already explained a little bit versus usual care. Now usual care, they didn't specify what that meant. That is whatever care the hospital normally does. And that was the other group. Um, and then they had the statistical analysis plan published before underlining the results. So um, there was there was there was blinding of the groups. And ultimately the trial had an 80 to 90 percent power. It looked at uh, mortality at 90 days. What I'm going to do, because they looked at so many things, I'm just going to open up the table from the paper because going through each thing individually would take hours. I'll do that afterwards. They looked at mortality at 90 days and then they also looked at secondary outcome measures. So in hospital stay, 28 day mortality, survival to one year, um, duration of stay in uh, A&E, ICU and hospital, and then also uh, parameters like uh, whether they, they had mechanical invasive mechanical ventilation, how long for, did they ever receive vasopressors or cardiovascular support, did they ever receive renal replacement therapy, and was there any difference between the two groups? They also looked at cost and cost effectiveness at 90 days. And then after that, they did some sub subgroup analysis, and again, the table for that is huge, um, to see if they could identify any specific groups that might benefit more from early goal directed therapy. Or not. Um, they so they recruited 4,211 patients uh, from 138 hospital sites between March 2008 and July 2014. So it's a lot of patients over a long period of time. So that's why the, this study's got high power. Um, they excluded some patients, some were lost to follow-up, uh, some were because the patients withdrew their consent halfway through the trial, 
Um, but also they uh, completely excluded an entire trial called process and I'm not really sure why they don't say that in the paper. Um, and then they randomly assigned uh, the patients to, to usual care or early goal directed therapy. And really they didn't find any significant difference between the two groups, even with multiple subgroup analysis. Um, there was a slightly higher stay, stay on ITU and a slightly risk, higher risk of getting vasopressor therapy in the early goal directed therapy group. Um, but other than that, all of the other um, subgroup analyses that they did didn't end up being statistically significant. So I'm going to show you those now. So I'm going to just come out of this and show you the paper. So if anybody in this group is really excited by data analysis, this is the paper for you. Because I think the pe the people who designed this spent a lot of time. Can you still see what I'm? Um, can you still see? Yeah, there's still. Right. Full screen. Then. I'm gonna make it full screen. So sorry, the writing's really small. This is table one, and all it is is a description of the two different groups and how they fall in each of these categories. So this table goes over two pages. Um, I'm not gonna go over every single thing, but essentially. Like I always feel a little bit nervous when the, the numbers are so beautiful, <laughs> like I feel like how did they manage that? It's supposed to be random, but they have beautifully divided uh, groups in each of the different subgroups. So, you know, it's evenly split across age and sex. And then they also, you know, made sure everything was relatively evenly, um, evenly, evenly spread out between the two groups in, in terms of where they thought the infection was coming from. So all these patients had sepsis of some form. Um, and, you know, if you, if you compare the two groups, there's very little that's different between them and it's almost too good to be true, I think. Um, they looked at lots of different criteria. So um, they, you know, they looked at whether there was an early refractory hypotension, whether there was a raised lactate um, and there was a fairly even division between the, you know, the, the subgroups in each group that met those criteria were even across the two groups studied. Um, then they also looked at systolic blood pressure, MAP, they did the Apache scores, SOFA scores, and again, the two groups are fairly comparable. I mean, it's a bit too beautiful, isn't it? Um, then they also looked at um, time from um, their presentation in A&E to randomization, time from their presentation in A to being included in the study, and again, there's an even spread between the two groups. So that's that's just um, that's just a table describing the population that was studied. Um, if I move on to the next table, so this is a complex table that again spans two pages that looked at their uh, outcome criteria. So there was the primary outcome criteria of death at 90 days. There's no difference between the two groups. So early goal directed um, therapy doesn't improve death at 90 days. Then again, all the secondary outcomes that they studied, so death at hospital discharge, death at 28 days, time in ED, time in ITU, amount of um, time in hospital, amount of uh, organ support that they received, there was no difference between the two groups, except um, here, the uh, the early goal directed therapy group received a little bit more cardiovascular support. Um, then finally, uh, they looked at cost effectiveness and nothing, there was no difference between the two groups. I don't know whether it's more expensive to have this early goal directed therapy protocol, um, but it, according to the study, it's not more expensive than whatever the usual therapy is in the hospital. I'm going to show you guys this again later. And then finally, so anyone that gets excited by forest plots, there's this beautiful forest plot that again spans two pages um, with lots and lots and lots of subgroup analysis. And all it means is this line here, if it's more to the left, it means that uh, early goal direct early goal directed therapy was better in this subgroup. 
And if it's more to the right, it means usual care is better in this subgroup. And every single one of these lines crosses the middle line, meaning there's no difference between the two groups that's statistically significant, except for this one here in people that have severe liver disease, suggests that usual care is better. And this line, where did it go in the next page? There is a line that spans to the left, but again, it's in a, in a slightly niche group, this one. So respiratory care, uh, res patients with se uh, severe coexisting respiratory conditions, uh, illegal directed therapy is better. But it's, it's a shame. They've done so many exciting statistical things with all this data that um, that's all that, that's all you can really infer from it. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation now. Hang on, what am I doing? Don't look. OK, you can look. So we've talked about all of this. Um, this is, I suppose, the most important graph. It's um, a Kaplan-Meier graph comparing survival um, between the two groups, and there's no difference. So what can we infer from this paper? Or what does it mean? It's a high powered meta analysis that demonstrates there's no evidence to support uh, early goal directed therapy. Um, subgroup analysis also didn't identify any groups which might benefit from early goal directed therapy. Um, what are some issues with this paper? I think it's important to highlight. They did mention that an entire trial was excluded from data analysis and they didn't really say why. Uh, it was quite a large chunk of the patients that were recruited. Um, and also, this is the biggest bugbear I have with this paper. No one defined what usual care means. And all the hospitals that were part of the study, there was more than 100 of them. They probably each do usual care in a completely different way. So we don't know what we're comparing and uh, early gore directed therapy to because it will be different in every hospital. I suppose all, all it does is that it takes away from the, um, it removes a lot of the significance of that early trial from 2002 that people would still follow um, with early core directed therapy. That's all I have to say on that. Is there anything that anyone read that I haven't touched on that you would like to discuss? I didn't look at all the, the numbers. Did they talk about things like length of like you stay? They did, yeah. No, the only thing that was a difference was um, there was a high risk of vasopressor therapy in the early in the early group in the in the early gold directed oh. therapy. Which makes sense, I suppose. Is it worth looking at fluid as well? No. They didn't measure that really. Because they haven't specified what usual care means. So there's no, there was no measurement of fluid balance or um, fluid monitoring or anything like that. So it's kind of, yeah, it would have been nice, wouldn't it? There's a volume administered, but not a fluid balance. Oh, so there is a total volume. Sorry, I haven't had a chance to read it. Total volume administered. And are they the same? Which They're one actually very similar. Where is that? The given is the same. It's the bottom oh, yeah, of yeah. table one. Yeah, here. I wonder if they get the numbers between the two groups so similar. I would love to know that because I find that a bit. Which I find that a bit disturbing. They, which patients are they including and excluding to, to achieve that? Well, this is a meta analysis of three big studies, isn't it? Like three big. Yeah. You would expect one of these groups to not be so even, wouldn't you? It feels like they've been cherry picked to make well, the data. Well, I'm not a statistician, but I guess that happens to be exactly trial, doesn't it? How you include, how you, how you, how you, you know, how you power your study and what your patient selection criteria is. I don't think they made them up, Grace. <laughs> they didn't. So, I'm, I'm not saying they've made it up. I'm just saying I'm a bit, I'm a bit you're upset there wasn't a uh, definitive oh, statistical it's, it's, possible, it's possible the criteria were the same for normal usual care and will they 
when you go back to that yes, there's no definition of what they did anyway. Yeah, but that's saying do what you want versus following the protocol, isn't it? So you, you might actually find that a lot of people basically do the same thing. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> Oh, yeah. I contribute to the discussion because I bear some responsibility having suggested we look at this paper. <laughs> um, and the reason was um, it, it goes back to the original paper by Rivers et al. in about 2001, I think, um, which was a single centre study uh, in an American ED and this chap called Manny Rivers. Uh, he, and it, the, the, the history is that sort of I suppose in the 90s, um, people were very interested in oxygen delivery um, as uh, as a very important um, outcome and as a goal for treatment. Um, so we used to measure cardiac outputs um, and and calculate oxygen content in the blood and you know, calculate oxygen delivery. And originally it was thought that, that aiming for supranormal goals, so uh, a, a cardiac um, output of, or a cardiac index of greater than 3.1 would be beneficial in patients with uh, critical illness. Um, and as a sort of consequence of that, Rivers did this study where basically he, he gave goal-directed therapy, which was directed to, towards um, ultimately a target of uh, central venous oxygen saturation as a surrogate for, for um, oxygen delivery and consumption and he did it for six hours and produced remarkable results uh, so, so something like a 25 cent reduction in mortality uh, yeah. and lots of people didn't quite believe it because it was just too good to be true and so that prompted the three big randomized trials the promise process and arise studies to sort of look at this in a multi-center um, and a multi-center setting and again it was this, it was based on the same premise it, it, it was um, giving this intervention but just for six hours and that that would somehow make a difference in other words early intervention to these kind of artificial goals would make a difference to overall outcome um, and of course it didn't you know, if you're going to do that, well, A, you've got to understand what the goals mean. You've probably got to personalise it. Um, uh, th there should be a better physiological explanation than just um, uh, uh, than, than lactate, which was kind of what it was based on. Um, and yeah, if you're going to do it, you might might want to do it for the, for the length of somebody's critical illness, not just for six hours and expect that that would make a difference. And of course it didn't. So, and the results were remarkably similar. Um, usual care was just, and certainly in the PROMISE trial, it was just what you would have done. So it was the responsible um, ICU or ED doctor, what they would have done normally. So if they felt the patient needed a central line, then they'd put a central line in. Um, if they just needed fluids or fluid challenges, then they would just do that. Um, so that, that was sort of what it's about. Yeah. Um, yeah, they also said in the discussion of this paper that um, some people feel that maybe this, the patient selection in the Rivers paper was that they just selected sicker patients. But they have also done subgroup analysis in the sicker patients of, of, this, of this large study mm. and found that there was no difference. Mm. So it's higher powered than the Rivers paper. Mm. Yeah. But it sort of changed practice because, you know, at a time in the 90s and early 2000s, we were all we were sticking swan gans catheters in, well, maybe not, maybe earlier than that, but we were targeting these artificial variables and treating people um, according to, to numbers, basically, uh, to those sort of numbers, um, without really good evidence that it, it, it was made any difference, and it probably doesn't. So. Usual care in the 90s is different to usual care now, though. Well, it is. That's true. So we, you know, we probably give a lot more fluids than we did. Well, probably, probably more. Maybe it varies. It varies. Exactly. Yeah, we probably give less than we did it in the early 2000s. I think. Um, probably give earlier vasopressors and antibiotics and 
sepsis management's improved in general, hasn't it? So. Well, it has, although, is Dr Parker in the room? No. Because no. the sepsis 6 also doesn't make a difference. Oh, but that's <laughs> worse, isn't it? Shh. <laughs> it's, also, it's also really important that we have negative studies published. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I've got the joy of presenting uh, this effects of phytosal albumin for saline versus saline alone outcomes from large volume resuscitation in critically ill patients. Um, so, I don't know if anyone has read this article. But essentially, I read it and didn't really understand what on earth was going on. <laughs> so I am going to try and I essentially had to walk myself through it quite gradually. So I'm going to essentially try and walk you through it a little bit, just so that you can try and make sense of what's gone on and see if we can come to a conclusion together. Um, I've picked up on issues as I've gone through. So you'll notice that I will have circled things um, in, in a red circle, a little box and gone through. And they're just kind of things that I've noted as I've gone through and kind of have, um, added to my conclusion really about the whole paper. Um, so I kind of started off just looking at the authors. Um, there's a couple of them. And then um, the two here that I've circled in red, they're probably my first concern. So they're obviously all American. It's an American paper. Um, Nomez and Priyanka are the first authors. Um, but this one that I've circled, the Gryfols, is actually a plasma derived medicines company which has obviously supported and slightly funded this paper, which when the one of the uh, interventions they're looking at is related to albumin, it's slightly mm -hmm. of concern to me. Um, the other ones are just pharmacological companies, essentially, and then some national funding. It was published in the Society of Critical Care Medicine um, paper in 2020, so it's quite new, and obviously it's a national paper. Um, paper. Um, so then I had a look at sort of what the aims and the hypotheses were. They did put those in the paper. Um, you can kind of see them there, the aim being to determine the effect between the, these two fluid regimes um, and the effect of that on mortality and the development of AKI in patients with receiving LVR. They refer to LVR throughout the paper. When they may say it, they mean large volume resuscitation. And then they stated the hypothesis that the exposure to the albumin plus the saline would result in lower mortality and development of AKI compared to just saline. Um, and then I've gone on to think about have they, kind of, you know, have, have they got a good question that they're starting off with um, in terms of this, this paper and the research they're doing. And I didn't think that I could find the research question in the text, um, but if someone else has been able to, I'd be uh, very pleased to hear where it is. Um, so then I've had a quick look through what there is already um, in terms of research on onto fluids. Obviously, there's the Albios trial, which has been referenced in the um, sort of the discussion they've had as they lead into the paper and then in the results itself. They haven't interestingly referred to the SAFE trial, uh, which is probably a little bit more um, applicable to this one, given that it also looks at albumin and saline. Um, with the primary outcome from that paper being that death of any that there wasn't any difference in, in the death um, of any cause in the 28-day period after randomization, um, but for some reason they've not referenced it, and I'm not really sure why. And I think that's <coughs> me. Uh, so I've gone on then to have a quick look through the study design. So um, it's a retrospective study. They've looked at data sets, uh, data from two different sites. One's called H08 and one's called H15. Um, I'll, I'll explain both of those there in a second. So H08 was critically ill adult patients admitted to an ICU in a single facility. And then the date of that was July 2000 to October 2008. And then H15 was high Denic 15, which is data from adult patients in different ICUs, 13 facilities in a different time span, which was October 2008 to December 2014. Um, so I, essentially to me those things are all items of concern, the fact it's a retrospective observation study and the differences between the, the times of collection and obviously the one being one single study, one single unit of versus 13. Um, so what they've essentially tried to do and that they explain it in their first part of the paper, they've started with the H08 8 database and then they've tried to confirm and probe their results and we reproduce their analysis in the H15 study. 
um, but they're still at different time spans, which doesn't quite make sense. So they've gone on to give you a, a table just explaining the differences in the cohorts. Um, I think for me, I've got some sort of key points here is that the enrolment periods are different, despite this being a retrospective study. They have used a lot of different hospitals and ICUs. And if you look at the table quite closely, you can see that the ICU types differed, some are hate surgical in H15. But then they haven't included, um, also they've included a NICU, um, which obviously this is an American paper, so we probably need to check what NICU means in America. Is it is it neonatal or is it is it not? Because I was under the impression throughout the paper that it was an adult study, but it's not quite clear. Um, they've also said that they've included primary care in HDENIC 15 over here. If you look at the staffing, um, the intensivist staffing at the different sites seems to be very different, potentially be different, and they've not really explained what they mean by that or what consult only is. They've included a different hospital location in one of the trials in the 15 trial, it includes a re uh, rural, rural hospitals. They've included a lot more secondary outcomes in this second group, the H15, compared to the first, the H H08. Um, and they have tried to match the inclusion criteria and the but the subgroup analysis has differed between the two again. All of that really for me was a bit like a bit of concern, to be quite honest. Um, so then well, they, they've got their data from some electronic databases, essentially. Um, the electronic healthcare record system at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And then they've used the renal database um, for AKIs and also for looking at the outcomes of the renal replacement therapy and then the National Death Index database to look at essentially what's happened to the patient afterwards. Um, they then select taking their data out of these sources. Um, not, obviously, we, we don't use electronic records probably in quite the same way that they do over there. So if we were to be doing that over here, the reliability of those two sources would be, these sources would be slightly worrying. Then they've gone on. So I had to essentially try and, I've, I've uh, made this fairly simple compared to how I read it initially in the paper, because I'm trying to hard to make sense of. So their study cohort was critically ill patients who received um, large volume resuscitation, and then they've defined that as greater than or equal to 50 or, eight, or equal to 60 mils per kilo, regardless of the type of IV fluid in a single 24 hour period. But they've also excluded patients with an AKI prior to the definition of um, large volume resuscitation. Um, they then calculated their effect size and odds ratios that, they've, that they're going to be using for their study. They've set that at 0.52 and then they calculate their sample size, 14 and a, around 14 and a half thousand. And then they've looked at the number of patients that need to receive the albumin to reach an 80% power. All of these, these circle things again are, are things that have concerned to me. Obviously, they're 60 mils per kilo, regardless of the IV fluid type. It's a bit of an unusual definition for IV fluid type. And I'm not overly sure that you would give somebody 60 mils and, uh, per kilo of saline and then say that you can compare that to 60 mils per kilo of saline and albumin because it's not surely going to be the same, but open to thoughts about that. And obviously the fact they've excluded the AKI prior to setting that definition um, means that they're probably excluding patients that are already quite sick. Um, I'm going to have, to have a quick look through the exposure there. So their exposure really is, is the type of fluid received for large volume resuscitation into patients receiving only 0.9% isotonic saline, which is what they see as their saline group or patients receiving the 5% albumin in addition to the 0.9% saline, which they refer to as their albumin group. Um, they phrase that quite strangely through the rest of the paper. If you didn't read, there's one, it's in one small paragraph at some point. If you didn't read that or catch that, you would think that they were just being given albumin um, versus saline, whereas actually that's not the case. And then the other point of also of concern um, is that They've met, it's obviously it's it's a um, retrospective 
study, but the decision to use the 5% albumin or the salines at the discretion of the treating physician. Um, so you've got potential bias being uh, brought in there as well. And then got in to show us how they've broken down the groups in terms of the numbers when they've taken patients out because they're not eligible and then how they've given the fluids and it's come out with the final two group sizes at the bottom here. Um, so quite, still quite large numbers of patients. So then they told you, they told you, they go on to tell you what their primary outcome is, that is hospital mortality at 30 days, and then they give you their secondary outcomes. But obviously, there's lots of those 90 days and a year mortality, development of moderate to severe AKI within 72 hours, um, and then two, stage two to three AKI, they then look up uh, later on the AKI recovery, major adverse kidney events at 30, 90, uh, 90 days and a year, and, and there's other outcomes they look at later on. Um, so then they go on to do a priory subgroup analysis plan for everybody that may not have heard of it. I don't think I'd heard of it until I looked at this paper. I've given you the definition there. Um, so the priory subgroup analysis is one that's planned, documented before examination of data, uh, data preferably in the protocol. Ideally includes a hypothesized size of effect. And then um, also it's noted here, uh, something that I found whilst I was trying to look this definition up and what it actually is, that subgroup treatment effect interactions identified um, post hoc must be interpreted with caution. Um, it's just for anybody that needs a definition like I did. Um, so they selected some subgroups for uh, the, this analysis in, in only one of the two cohorts, the 15 cohort. They've used ICD, um, the International Classification of Disease, the ninth edition, which is really, I will circle it in a minute because actually we're on ICD-10 and we've been on ICD-10 since October 2015. So I'm really not entirely sure why they've used ICD-9. Um, I don't know if there's any differences in the particular groups they were looking at between 9 and 10, but it just seemed a bit unusual. They've also used, it, used the sepsis 3 definition um, and I, reading around it, I've noticed that there's there some concerns worldwide about some of the, the definitions, um, including the sepsis 3 and the application of it. Um, and then they've done a, an analysis essentially of the mortality at 30 days. Um, so yeah, they're the points that I've kind of circled. So H15, just doing the subgroup analysis in one group of patients is a concern, the ICD-9 and then sepsis 3 definition. Um, so then I, the study design, so they haven't really been particularly open about their study design. You can tease it out, but if I remember rightly, it was more in their supplementary data than it was in the actual text itself. Um, so essentially they've divided, they've divided things into categorical variables and then they've developed, a, come up with a percentage or a number and then continuous variables and they come up with a mean or median and interquartile range. And then they've used this thing called backward selection to select variables. Um, so I'll look at that before I move on along that page, that's that slide there. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of that. I hadn't heard of that um, until I read this article too. Um, so uh, this is why I will be giving this a circle. And the reason is, is this is a sort of stepwise regression te technique. And I found that it's quite popular apparently in data mining. So it essentially uses the statistical significance to select the explanatory variables that they're going to use. Um, so it's something to really kind of take note of if you see it coming up um, and it fits with how they've then gone on to go through and to come out with their outcomes. Um, so they then develop these diagrams um, which uh, are used to look for count confounding and then they've done their multivariate variable logistic regression model models. So these are their study design, their, their DAG graphs, so they may be new to a lot of people also. They may not be, but they were new to me. Um, so these are sort of directed graphs um, that look for potential confounders. Um, and essentially the idea of it is, is that factors in the graph are connected with arrows. The arrows can only go in a direction of a causal relationship and no directed path can form a closed loop. Um, as the factors, as a factor can't cause it itself, essentially. Um, the, none of these are in the actual text. They're only in the supplementary content. Um, they've not, and they've 
quite difficult to actually access. Um, they're also, I found these ones quite small to even see and, you know, to understand where all the arrows are going, but they have identified some. Going on to look at the methodology, they hadn't actually referenced that in the article. Um, they briefly referenced it in the supplementary digital contents, um, but really that probably was a bit of a worry. So then they've gone on to their results. So they've just summarised, they summarised briefly what the two groups have ended up being. So HOA is 45, 000, 45 and a half thousand encounters and then 4,710 of those receiving the large volume of solicitation. But then the cohort included 2,428 2, patients after exclusions, of which 1,755 received the, the saline and the and 673 albumin. And then H15, similarly, they've, they've started off with 164,910 encounters, then reduced that down to 39,918. And then they've brought it down again after exclusions, and then they've, that's come up reduced further still into South Saline and then the Albumin groups. Um, so then they've gone on to tell you about their cohort characteristics, and they've given you the medians. Um, and the meets are the median Saline and Albumin volumes within the 24-hour windows. Um, they seem very different, and they don't really explain why. Um, and they haven't commented when they when they've gone through these the medians in the results, they haven't said how much albumin they had and also how much saline they had in that second group, the saline and albumin group, which is a bit unusual. And I find it a bit unhard, it's quite hard to make sense of. Um, and then they go on to tell you about the total volumes in the 24 hour window. And you can see that saline had about four litres, albumin four four litres, 761 mils. So they've got quite wide ranges. So I think the how they've labelled these two groups is, is fairly misleading. You, if you read it straight off, it's sometimes it's quite hard to make sense of the fact that, that they're talking about albumin group, but albumin and saline versus saline, they're not open and transparent about how much of each boat they received. Um, so I found that quite hard to make sense of in the in the actual article. Can just ask a quick question? Yeah. Did they define by volume of solicitation as 60 mils per kilo? Yeah. Yeah, they did. And then they've gone on to start going through the results. So this is where it's 60 mils per kilo in 24 hours. Yeah, that's what that was. So they're only giving them all their patients, their, their patients are about 60 kilos each, which is all. Yeah, exactly. So then they start giving you the results and essentially they start, the authors start off going through their unadjusted outcomes. Um, so I kind of think there was a couple in the, in the unadjusted outcomes that I kind of just had noticed and I guess will be interested for people's thoughts later on, is that the mortality, unadjusted mortality here, from my understanding that p-value would not be statistically significant. Um, and then I just wanted to pick up on this bit down here. This is not all unadjusted, but really the stays are very similar. Um, but I'm sure um, somebody might be able to help me with the kind of understanding that, given that it's unadjusted later on. Um, and then they comment at the same point when they start to talk about the unadjusted outcomes, about the use of albumin being associated with higher rates of AKI, which I can only presume they pulled off at the bottom here. Um, this part here and then saying that this is statistically significant because of the p-value. Um, they go on to give you a further um, table in the article about unadjusted outcomes. Um, Are they using the stage one, stage two, stage three of AKI that ICE uses that's useless? Pardon? You know, you, so yeah. you know AKI, yeah. stage one, two and three, yeah. that doesn't mean anything. Uh, they're not the side of. It's the, yeah, it's the division of the eight. Okay. Just based on the changing pattern. Yeah. But if it's anything like when ICE tells us it's stage one, two, and three. So what happens? The Kedagon has got an internationally agreed criteria, so like it's standard all throughout. So. Okay. 
Um, so they've said off of this this graph, then they go on to comment to say that the use of five percent albumin was associated with lower rate of um, make um, 30, 90, and 36. Uh, 365 days compared with saline alone, and they state in the art, in their discussion of the results that this was driven by mortality. Um, and then they say that this is because when they then adjusted for the mortality, when the mortality, when the differences between the two groups disappeared when mortality was excluded, but they've not presented that evidence or how they've got to that um, in the article, as far as I can see, or in the supplementary details. Um, and then they also comment that the 5% albumin is not associated with persistent renal dysfunction or a higher rate of new onset dialysis. Um, and the AKI recovery is not different between the two groups, which in the unadjusted, in the unadjusted data does look OK. Then they go on to speak about their um, the primary outcome, which obviously was the 30 days, hospital mortality at 30 days. Um, I think there's something for us to kind of make we we'll come back to at the end. I'm not sure what's more important. Is it to be alive at 30 days, 90 days or a year? Um, but it's what they've used. Um, and they've said that the paper shows that use of 5% albumin was associated with lower adjusted 30 day mortality and then also 90 and one year. And that was in both both studies. Um, and the, I guess the question that I also have coming out of this is that wouldn't an AKI increase your risk of mortality in the first place? Um, and then obviously they've already excluded for AKI at the start of the paper for a pre-existing AKI, but if you're more likely to die, you would already have an AKI. So just a bit concerned about who they've excluded, excluded initially. Uh, they then go on to do some more <laughs> regression. <laughs> Um, essentially, and now they also bring in uh, odds p-value and then an e-value. So I hadn't heard of an e-value either until this paper. Um, so just for those people that don't know, it's it's essentially a minimum strength association on the risk ratio scale that an unmeas unmeasured confounder would need to have with both treat would need to have with both treatment and outcome to fully explain a a specific treatment and outcome association. I.e., the larger an e-value, um, this this would imply considerably unmeasured confounding and would need, need be needed to explain effect. Um, so explain the effect estimates. So I think just for those of you that don't know what that means, uh, I didn't until I read this paper. Um, so then they go on to do even more analyses. Um, then they do further subgroup ana um, analyses for mortality. Um, and then they go on again to do even more for AKI. And then they continue producing various graphs and now they produce some survival estimates, which do show, do kind of, you know, as a, a quick glance show that saline only um, would have a, is a, a better, better outcome compared to the albumin. Oh no, sorry, the other way around. The albumin has a better outcome outcome compared to the saline only. And then they go on to produce a Cox model for this survival, but only now using the H15 cohort. And then they go on to produce further um, data and, and, and do further analyses. Um, and then so essentially this time they're looking at the fluid in the total fluid intake in the first 72 hours um, for the in the admission for mortality at 30 days and then severe AKI. And then they go on to do even more analysis, um, which I'm just essentially going to quickly skip over. Really, they've done it now for the subgroups being sepsis, CT surgery and hepatic. And then they go on again and do further this time looking at the length of stay. Um, just one to draw to here is I don't think this one would be significant, the length of stay. Um, they only did this in one group now, the H15 group. So essentially, I don't feel really that their results are clearly stated from what they've actually picked up in those graphs. They seem to have ignored quite a few results. There's quite a few non, non statistically significant results there. Um, and it's quite unclear really that 
if the data in all those supplementary graphs has actually been presented in the text, it's really hard to make sense of. Um, and when you have to really go through both the, the paper and the supplementary graphs at the same time. They've identified some limitations um, themselves. Um, I think the first one may also be of concern to people here, essentially raising this. They've commented that recent trials have raised significant doubts about the use of saline and more physi physiologic fluids. They've said, obviously named it as lactated ringers, but Hartman's, um, which may now, may now represent the standard of care. Um, obviously, we use Hartman's a lot, so I'm not sure how we be able to apply this sort of study to our patient groups, given that we don't, we would use more Hartmann's than we would saline anyway. Um, very few patients were treated with both albumin and balanced crystalloids during the, before the comparison. Um, obviously it's a retrospective, which they've obviously noted themselves. Um, they've commented on how their, their e-values could be explained by unmeasured confounders. Um, and then Towards the bottom there, they comment that they don't have sufficient data to evaluate the impact of food resuscitation on the goals of resuscitation, hemodynamics, acid base balance or tissue perfusion. Um, and then also they comment that commented that the that this study alone um, during because of the design of the study of the estimation of the effect of 5% albumin on mortality may be overestimated. And then their final conclusions essentially is that during large volume resuscitation, 5% albumin is associated with lower mortality when compared with the use of saline alone. Um, however, that albumin was also associated with the higher rate of AKI that did not translate into persistent renal dysfunction or into the need of the dialysis. But they commented that further studies are needed into large volume resuscitation. So kind of my opinion, um, it was a difficult paper to work through and analyze and they've used obviously some statistical techniques that are of concern, particularly that backward selection. Um, and it very much seems that there may potentially have been some data dredging of some form. Um, they've used two databases to collect their data, um, the H08 and then the, and then formed these two cohorts, the H08 and then the H15. Um, I'd be concerned that is, if this, is this database even applicable to the sort of UK populations? Um, they've excluded AKI prior to the large volume resuscitation. Um, I'm not sure necessarily that the sort of definitions of the AKI are completely clear in the paper. Are they going off just creatinine or are they going off the EGFR? And in, in the relationship to AKI with the use of fluid resuscitation in the first place. Um, the decision being left, uh, the decision to use the 5 percent albumin or the saline at the discretion of the treating physician, obviously it's not a randomised controlled trial that couldn't be introducing bias and an RCT would be better. And then we kind of need to think about which patients would get albumin in the first place. Is it the more sick patients that would get it? Get it? Um, obviously they've only used saline as an alternative fluid and we need to consider um, whether or not the patients would be given Hartman's as potentially the alternative fluid. Um, I think probably other specific disease conditions needs to be looked at further, so for example cirrhosis, because obviously things like liver disease would influence whether or not you use albumin or saline anyway. Not really commented on in their prose of the paper. I interested in, I just, I simply put the name of the paper into Google and I found the infographic for it, which very much simplified what the paper had said. And just a, some kind of some medical Twitter, obviously lots of things go on to Twitter now and some of the things that as I was reading it, I found other people were kind of commenting on. Um, so yeah, I'd appreciate some, if anybody's got any other thoughts on this paper, I'd be grateful for them. Do you know when I barged in about the AKI run group two and three, did they explain how they defined the AKI in the paper? Yeah, so they talked about how to make it over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I, do, I, I find it quite concerning how many, just how many patients they're getting 60 mils per kilo of fluid to, and then giving them quite a small dose of albumin. <laughs> It just seems a bit random. 
You can't really tell how much albumin they've given. Well, there was a slide that said it talks about average dose of albumin, wasn't it? It was about, I mean, interesting, they, they define it by 60 mils per kilo, but their maximum saline dose was about 6 litres and about 750 mils of albumin, which is like one of the bottles, isn't it? Which is, I mean, how you can extrapolate the first 24 hours of doing that to a 90 day mortality, unless I'm just not clever enough. It's a possibility. Uh, It's all retrospective as well. It's a retrospective data dredge to uh, one of those big American databases, is it? They've just applied yeah. statistics to it so they've got something they want, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Which still doesn't give them a positive outcome. Still, the conclusion is, yeah, not really any difference. Yeah, exactly. Catherine, did you yeah, want to join me? Okay. <laughs> Is, is it Sorry, again. a question to Catherine asking her how much she enjoyed looking at this paper. Uh, I think I started with the authors and I looked at my first point and it probably wasn't the best one for this paper. Is I, my first thing that I did was to look at who funded the paper. And I saw that the plas one of the blood plasma companies has obviously had quite a lot of funding into it. And I think that immediately maybe impacted on my views of the paper. <laughs> I found it really difficult, to be honest, to look through it and to read through it and to try and get my head around what they've done. Well, I think it was Paris that chose it, so you can thank him for it. <laughs> it's not easy to read. I think there was this one here that I picked up on earlier on, ironically, I forgot to mention it, but their groups of patients were very different between the two studies as well and the groups of patients they've actually selected. And I'm not sure if that rep represents the populations they've looked at, but it, it there was essentially so much data in there, it was actually really hard to even look through the, so through all these graphs. Unless maybe the first database was replaced by the second database in 2008, maybe. No, I mean, I, I did have a quick look at it. The, the 2008 basis was one hospital. Yeah. And the 2015 or 14 was, was it eight or? 13. More? 13. 13. I, I just wondered if maybe the first hospital had been amalgamated into some kind of, you know, like the Americans have these kind of hospital conglomerates, don't they? It is, yeah. So it's the same. It's the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center, but it's got, the, there's the sort of teaching hospital in wherever it is, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and then it, also included all the other district hospitals in the second, second cohort as well. So, so it is the comparing one apples. Is 13 hospitals and 100 ICUs. Yeah, so it's comparing apples and pears. And just a couple of observations. If something is not in the, is in the supplementary data, it doesn't mean automatically that the authors are trying to hide anything because that decision is made by the, um, usually the reviewers and the, um, editors of a particular journal. Um, okay. So the, the fact that you could get to it um, because you're particularly keen and interested is fine. Because well, that it, makes sense of a lot of what they've done without finding it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that may, maybe it could have been presented differently, but it, what I'm saying is it, it doesn't mean that they're trying to hide anything. Um, okay. And similarly, the, com the complicated stats um, are without being an expert on these particular ones, they're, they're probably okay. Yeah. Um, so in these big, very complicated data sets with massive heterogeneity in the different populations, you can't just do a t-test at the end of it and expect to find a, um, a resource. And if you do that, it's, so, so what they have to do is things like propensity scoring, so yeah. you account for the different factors that affect a particular result and then sort of do whatever they do statistically. And, but, it, but essentially it's an attempt to take out some of the, the other factors um, and, and try and drill down the, the single effect of one particular intervention. Um, 
in this so case. So, Catherine, sorry, yes. is it going to change your practice? Are you going to resuscitate with albumin? I don't think so. I don't think there's there was. I think they've tried really. You know, they've they. I think there's so many sort of unknowns in it. Um, probably want to read a bit more that would back it up. Because there's all sort of, you know, other side, other effects of using albumin that, that that isn't really referenced at all. Yeah. And I'm not sure our patients in this country would be particularly similar to theirs as well. So I'm not sure how how you could transfer the results completely over to our patient population here. Well, the patients are probably similar enough. When you look at the groups, they're quite different compared to some of ours, not all of them. So does this mean that in America, when you, whenever you, you get healthcare, you, you can send to your data being used for these kinds of trials? I don't think you can send it to the You can do it there, it's happening to you. Well, I'm sure. Inside of this country. Well, I'm sure it's at least. Well, I'm sure. Yeah, the code everything. Yeah, they code everything in America. Everything is coded to the demon. Any other comments? I just want to make one other observation. It's important to remember the background to these sort of albumin fluid trials um, is that there was a lot of noise again a number of years ago um, suggesting that um, albumin in particular was harmful. Um, it, and it's, it goes back to about the late 1990s. Um, and there was a very famous meta analysis published in the BMJ, uh, which in, didn't involve any intensivists. To, to, but involved statisticians um, and epidemiologists that conclude that albumin was killing people. Um, and that was followed by, it was the SAFE study actually, it was a randomised control, big Australian study, which suggested no, it probably wasn't. Um, and if anything, I, you know, whatever you can take from this, I'd, my reading would be, well, it probably confirms that albumin isn't as harmful as some, as some people have suggested previously. Um, that's probably all you can conclude. Um, but John Callum is a massive name in renal and intensive care medicine. Um, just as, as an observation, it, you know, it, 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 it's not, it, it, the, the, the research team is, is quite well respected yeah. uh, in, in the field. So, um, But yeah, it's the same as all retrospective database studies. It's a sort of, yeah, thanks, very good. What do we learn? And the answer is probably not, not an awful lot really strong, I would say. But. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, we've gone on way beyond where we were supposed to, so I better let you go and do some work. Um, there's the QR code for the feedback if you want to take a picture. I've also put the link in the chat. Um, next week, uh, Dr. Keishan is talking about management of shock. So, um, kind of the fluid resuscitation journal club that we've had will kind of follow on nicely to that for next week. Otherwise, thank you very much for uh, Professor and Grace and Catherine for presenting. Um, I'll let you get on with your day. I hope you have a lovely weekend, everybody.